record-breaking inflation, squeezed public services, a Conservative government that went from promising the biggest tax cuts in 50 years to taking the country's tax burden to its highest level since the Second World War. So, what is the plan? I speak to the person in charge of the public purse, Jeremy Hunt. Hello and welcome to Beth Rigby Interviews. Just last week, we saw the new Chancellor deliver his autumn statement in an effort to restore stability and confidence in the UK finances. But the political skill of Thursday's statement can't detract from the hard reality of what people are about to face. With squeezed public services, rising taxes, plus soaring food and energy bills, the cost of living crisis has its grips firmly on this country. The washing machine they're having to turn off now, but I'm not using it. Um, the cooker's now turned off at the wall, but I'm not using it. The same with the microwave and the air fryer. The pound, uh, which was up at around kind of one dollar and eight cents, has now fallen by kind of you know almost two cents. The pound has hit the lowest level ever. Um, it's not actually, you know, it's actually the lowest ever. It's not just since decimalisation, it's the lowest since, since the invention of the pound. It's too much money going into gas and electric. What is it, you feed your child or you don't feed your child? I want to be completely frank about the scale of the economic challenge we face. It's a historic moment for inflation because it's got up to the highest level that we've seen since the 1980s. Have a look at that. 11.1%, higher than economists had expected, higher since 1981. We need to take decisive action at home to get our borrowing and debt on a sustainable trajectory. We'll do that because that will help us tackle inflation. It will help us cut the costs of things. It will help us limit the increase in mortgage rates. I had a 92-year-old man two weeks ago who went out into his garden and shouted for help because he got no food. It's not something I want to deal with. It's horrific. It's affecting everybody. Today, we deliver a plan to tackle the cost of living crisis and rebuild our economy. But it means taking difficult decisions. There just isn't enough money to go around, basically. Um, I'm doing more hours, so I'm doing like 60 plus hours a week, and it seems to be going in taxes. So, and it still just isn't enough. I sat down with Jeremy Hunt to ask him the tough questions about the future of our economy and the future of the Conservative government. Chancellor, thank you very much uh, for joining us on, on the show today. Uh, and I want to start off with you as an MP for 17 years. You've been a cabinet minister on and off for the best part of a decade. And you know all too well, better than most, that economic competence is central to the Tory party brand and what voters associate your party with. Isn't the truth that what has happened recently and a bit beyond that has damaged that reputation, that it's taken a hit, and that actually your reputation for economic competence is in tatters at the moment? I think that's overstating it, but I, I do accept uh, that, you know, we've had a rocky period in the last couple of months. I wish that we hadn't had what happened with the mini budget and all the turbulence that happened there. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right. I mean, I became a member of the Conservative Party when I think I was 20 years old. Mm -hmm because I thought ours is the party that takes the tough and difficult decisions that mean that we can be a prosperous country, can pay for the NHS, our schools, all those things. And I think the Conservatives are the only party that take those decisions. And that was really what I was doing on Thursday. I was mm. saying that we all know how difficult it is, but if we want this to be one of the most prosperous countries in Europe, we've got to face up to the challenges we face and we've got to do it square on. And so I hope British people who, you know, won't have liked seeing their taxes go up, mm -hmm. will have been worried about some of the um, cuts in the growth in public spending. I hope they understand the purpose of this wasn't just uh, you know, misery for misery's sake. Mm -hmm. It was to make sure that we really have that bright future that and, everyone wants. And Chancellor, I'm going to get on to sort of more of the detail of, of the autumn stone, some of the decisions you made. But also the British people would have been watching that mini budget thinking, hang on a minute, part of this is, has been caused by the catastrophic budget, mini or otherwise, uh, that was unleashed 
just a few weeks earlier by Kwasi Kwarteng. It was, if you like, the most catastrophic moment, I think, in recent uh, political history and certainly uh, for the Conservative Party economically. Do you accept that the party is responsible for that? This isn't just about global economic headwinds. There was a domestic element and it was self-harm by your party that has put the British public in this situation. Well, I accept that there was turbulence and, as I say, I regret it. But we reversed those decisions. I did it within three days of becoming Chancellor mm. and I think just three weeks after they'd originally been announced. And the money that uh, matters to the country is what we have to pay to service our, our very big national debt. And the rates we pay for that are now below what they were um, before the mini-budget. So I think the long-term yeah. challenges we face are really the same as, as Germany, which has had a bigger downgrade in its growth forecasts, uh, Italy and France that are restricting their borrowing, America that's seen higher increases in their mortgage rates, and this is really because of the pandemic and Ukraine. It, it, it partly is, but there was a domestic element in it, and you're actually not denying that, you're accepting that. How much damage did Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng do uh, to the economy in, in number terms? Well, as I say, I don't believe there was a long-term impact because the measures they introduced were reversed so quickly. I think what the world wanted to see was that the United Kingdom was not going to spend money it didn't have, and was committed to repaying its debts. And Rishi Sunak and myself have given them that reassurance. And I think that's why you see what's happened in the markets very much settle down. Unfortunately, though, the big challenges we face with the global energy crisis, with the interruptions to supply chains following the pandemic, they mean that that isn't the only thing that we have to deal with. We have to deal yeah. with those much the, bigger issues, and that's what we're trying to do on, in the, in the autumn statement. Foundation did put a number on it, and if you'll see it, they, they said it was a £30 billion hit, uh, which was a mix of the tax rises, or sorry, the tax cuts, some of which you've now reversed, and also a £10 billion hit, which was the result of the market reaction. So there was something you needed to correct. You said you regret it. Are you sorry for it? I, I or don't... do you think it's not your fault? Well, I don't recognise uh, those Resolution Foundation figures mm. because the, the tax measures in the mini-budget were largely reversed. So I, I don't accept that analysis. Um, look, I take responsibility for the British economy under my party's management over the last 12 years. Mm. And if you look at the bigger picture, in mm. a 12-year period in which we've had three enormous shocks, a global financial crisis, a pandemic, and a global energy crisis, mm. we've actually had the third highest growth in the G7, faster than France, Germany, faster than Japan I'm, I'm or Italy. And so I think I'm, you know, overall, that is a very creditable economic performance, which I think is what people expect from a Conservative I'm, government. I'm going to ask you one more thing and I'm going to move on. I asked the Prime Minister whether he'd apologise for what happened, given the turmoil it caused and the, the, the anxiety it caused uh, people. He, he declined to do that. Would, would you like to apologise or do you think that that is something you don't need to do, that regret is enough? Well, I think in politics, actions speak louder than words. And I became Chancellor. Uh, within three days, mm. I had reversed those measures in the mini-budget. And very soon after that, the money that we have to pay as a country to pay for our national debt went mm. down to the levels you... of the mini-budget before it. So I think we okay. have demonstrated that we think what happened was wrong. Yeah. Uh, we've corrected it and we've put the country back on the right track. OK, well, let, let's move on um, to the UK economy and growth. Now, in your autumn statement, you said your priorities were stability, growth and public services. But the elephant in the room to all of this is Brexit. We don't talk about it much. It's almost become a taboo subject. Journalists aren't even asked allowed to really ask questions about it without feeling like you're somehow attacking Brexit, but it's hurt the economy. What do you think the hit to the UK economy uh, will be because of Brexit? Well, Brexit was a change in our trading relations with our biggest single trading partner. I've always believed, in fact, I believed even before the Brexit vote, that we could make a great success of Brexit. I think there's no reason why we can't be like... You want a Brexit here. Uh, no, I was worried about the, uh, the constitutional risks. But economically, 
I've always believed we can make a tremendous success of it and we can be like Canada or Australia or Japan, smaller countries that mm. absolutely thrive outside a big trading block. But let me uh, answer well, your question. It is a change. Well, I don't accept that Brexit is the cause of the big economic difficulties we face. And let me give you an example as to why I don't you know accept that. You know what the OBR figures are on yeah, this. But so let, me, let me answer the question, Beth, okay. because you know, Germany has seen its growth forecasts downgraded by 4.8%. Uh, compared to us who've seen our growth downgraded by 3%. So you're seeing countries like uh, Austria, Netherlands, Italy that have higher inflation than us. What we're seeing are global factors that are yeah. causing a shock to all major economies. I know, but people, p people watching this are worried about their own household incomes and their own economy and economic growth in the UK. The OBR... What has the OBR forecast? You know this about Brexit. Well, the, the OBR say that absent other changes uh, in, I think it's a decade's time, uh, we will grow less fast than we would have done. By but, 4%. But, yes. 4% medium term GDP, 4% lower than it otherwise would have been. Yes, yeah? absent other changes. And my point is, I think that there are lots of things we can do. Actually, things that I announced in my autumn statement when I talked about us becoming the world's next Silicon Valley, using Brexit freedoms to make sure that we change regulations in areas like uh, the development of new medicines or artificial intelligence or all the really big things that are going to shape the 21st century. Actually, being able to set your own regulations means that you can do some of those things in a way that wouldn't have been can possible the, inside the EU. But can you fill the whole of the economic scar in? Can you fill the whole? More than. Okay. And, and that's you, because, no, no, because in the end, Brexit is a choice that Britain as a country made. And whether we make a success of it or not is a choice that we now have to make. Mm. And what I outlined on Thursday for families up and down the country who are worried about their mortgages, worried but about the shopping bills, I, some short-term help but also a long-term vision as to how we can Charles, be me, a very successful country. Let me country. just, if you allow me to, let me just go back, because the 4% of GDP, you're a chancellor that's desperately needing growth in order to grow the economy, to increase the tax takes, to cut our taxes, uh, to increase spending in public services. Growth is central to all of that. We all know that. How much lost income and tax revenue does that 4% over the medium term add up to? You'll know the figure. Um, Beth, I don't accept the 4%. That 4% is a figure that says... But you says, accept the OBR well, figures sometimes you when you to, like them, such as falling no. inflation. You're happy to take that one. Yes, I don't, don't have to accept all of them. And that's one that so I... So you accept uh, the ones you like? Well, I accept the ones I agree with, and I don't accept the ones I don't agree with. That one I don't agree with, because that is saying, absent other changes, uh, that could be the impact. And I think we announced some very big changes... But in the autumn, say, hang on, no, 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 you can't just I move know, on I, because I, I'm not then move you're on. moving on from the answers that you don't I, like, I, and you know you've got to let me I, answer I'm, properly. I'm I, totally I, neutral on all your answers. Of course, it's not my you job are. to like or dislike okay. any of Well, this. then you need to let me answer, give you answers that maybe uh, you weren't hoping to hear. But what I outlined in the autumn statement was a plan for how we get to the other side, and it's really important because families are very, very worried about the mm. the pressures they're under. They're seeing their energy bills go up and so on. And what you, if you look at those OBR figures that mm. you were quoting the OBR just now, what do they actually say? The biggest worry for families mm. is prices going up. Mm. They say inflation is going to halve and then actually go down to zero mm. in the next two to three years. They say that growth, the other side, will be growing between two and three percent for the following three years. So what they show is that the decisions that I made mean that mm. the recession, the impact on and GDP is much less than it would have and been. And there's a lot of growth the other side. And I will come, I, will, I have lots of questions on the other side. I just want to quickly go back to this point on Brexit because these numbers that you don't expect from the, except from the independent forecast, the OBR, uh, that 4% GDP reduction over the longer term amounts to about £100 billion in lost trade and approximately £40 billion in tax revenue. I mean, people watching this will say, say, did we vote to become poorer because of Brexit? They might conclude that you have not made a success of this. Well, we, do you accept uh, those figures or you just do not accept them? No. I, I think I've said to you probably three times now that 
Those are what the OBR project, if we mm. don't do other things to take advantage of the opportunities mm. of Brexit. And what I announced on Thursday are the things that we are going to do. Let me give you another example of one of the things that we are absolutely determined to do uh, with, uh, in order to make a success of Brexit. People are worried, and a lot of people who voted for Brexit are worried about high levels of migration. And what we've said is that we want to use the moment of Brexit to move our economy to become a high-skill, mm. high-wage economy so that we have less dependence on migration. And what I announced on Thursday was a big program to look at our skills program. Now, if we can invest in the skills of our own people, mm reduce the pressures on migration, then we are taking advantage of that change to become a, a high-wage economy. Brexit, and I think that is Bre what Brexit, people voted for. Brexit happened, what, nearly three years ago. The UK has just announced record migration numbers today. Well, so are, the public look at this going, oh, yeah, you're going to reduce net migration. There are record migration figures, and we're poorer because of Brexit, according to the OBR figures you don't accept. Well, Can, I, I think... There are very specific reasons for the migration figures today. Half that increase is students, and then the other half is uh, people coming from Ukraine, from Afghanistan, from Hong Kong. Those are our international obligations. Mm -hmm. But people understand that if we want to reduce that need for migration over the longer term, we have to invest in skills, and that is the big change. Now, we've had, you know, within months of legally leaving the European Union, we had a once-in-a-century pandemic, mm. and the government's focus, absolutely rightly, in those two years, was saving the lives that Let's... were put at risk by COVID. But now we put the pandemic mm. largely behind us, and my statement on Thursday showed how we are going to forge a different economy outside the European Union, high skill, high wage, the world's next Silicon Valley, and, with and... our own regulations, and I believe we can do and that I'm because I think we've on, got an incredible country. I'm going to come on to the autumn state, but I just, just on Brexit, the final thing I wanted to ask you about was this from the OBR. The latest evidence suggests that Brexit has had a significant adverse impact on UK trade via reducing both overall trade volumes and the number of trading relationships between UK and EU firms. Do you accept trade has been dramatically hit? And can you understand why some business people now have to stop trading with the EU or relocate as a former entrepreneur yourself, it's quite painful for them, isn't it? I accept there is a transition for businesses because we voted as a country to change our trading relationship with the EU. That was a decision the whole country made. We had a, a proper democratic process and there is a change. And you know that transition uh, obviously presents difficulties for some businesses. What I don't accept is that the long-term impact of that decision will be to make us poorer. Mm. Quite the opposite. I think there are big opportunities for us to become uh, much more okay. wealthy than we would otherwise all, have been. And all I can, those are the opportunities as, that I want to embrace. As a, as a journalist, all I can work on are independent forecasts by the OBR rather than the promises that, that you're making about Brexit. And I think viewers will look at this and say, well, the OBR said there's this hit to GDP. You, as the Chancellor, well, are, are not accepting As long that. as you're making clear, Beth, that the OBR was talking about what the potential theoretical... Okay. Hang on, hang on, let me finish. Yeah, the, the potential po theoretical hit might be in 10 years' time, uh, and as long as you're also uh, recognising that the government thinks that we can make sure that doesn't happen. And, and finally, talk... as you're talking about the OBR, yeah. as long as you're recognising that they say that when we get through the recession in the next year and a half, we're going to be growing at a very healthy 2 to 3% a year for okay. the three years Chancellor that follow. Then, quickly, That's what because you've got I'm, to remember. I'm running out of time already. Let, let's just quickly go. So how could you mitigate it? And one of the things is ease in trade with the EU. You said last week unfettered trade with neighbours and countries around the world is very beneficial to growth. You spoke about being able to remove the vast majority of trade barriers with the EU. But you also have ruled out a Swiss-style deal which could include regulatory alignment in order to have more frictionless trade. Um, what would be the effect on the economy if we did have a Swiss-style deal? Well, that is not the right deal for the UK because, as I announced on Thursday, we are going to pursue different regulations as a, an independent sovereign country. But I'd just like to make a point, Beth. Um, you know, we've got a 20-minute interview and you've chosen to spend a huge amount of time mm. talking about Brexit I think when, it's actually, no, no, when actually 
if you look at what the OECD say, if you look at what the OBR say, they say the biggest reason for the decline in our economic picture is high international energy prices. And you haven't asked me anything about the big plans that we announced for energy. Uh, the we first, discussed that a no, lot. Not, not with me and use. not in this interview. And, and I, if I may say, I think... I'm happy to take no, a 30-minute interview with well, you keep going. I'm happy to talk about the things that matter. The OBR did not say that Brexit was the principal cause for the difficulties we faced. They said that was international energy prices and the economic shocks we've had over the last 15 years from the, um, from the pandemic and the global financial crisis, as well as what's happened in Ukraine. Now, what we announced on Thursday was a set of measures to deal with those shocks mm. so that we can reassure families, particularly about their energy bills. Short-term help, uh, £900 mm. this year, £500 next year for the average family. But then after that, a long-term plan to reduce our energy dependency on what Putin may choose to do with his neighbouring countries. So I think, if I may say, I think those are the things that your viewers need to hear about because they're what right, the OECD well, and the OBR and all these independent bodies, they're what, they, th those are the things that they say are causing our okay, economic difficulties. Okay, just final thing, then I quickly move on. The final thing on Brexit? Yes, yes just... Because, just, uh, just with respect, just, Beth, with Brexit is not the issue that all these independent commentators are talking about when they talk about challenges facing the British economy. So I'll answer your it, question, but let's make it the last one. I was just going to say, would a Swiss deal be economically good but politically undeliverable in your view? That no, was my final question. No, because uh, if we had a deal like Switzerland had, then we wouldn't have the opportunity to set our own regulations Fine, okay. and become the world's next Silicon Valley, which is my long-term plan for the British economy to make sure that we can fund things like the NHS in the future. OK, I want to just quickly go on to the autumn statement. I'm not, I haven't got much time left. Um, Estimate Vey, who was going to be your Deputy Prime Minister, had you, when you were going to stand, well, you did stand in July, uh, you were going to have Esther as your Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, she thinks that you have made political choices in this budget and overcorrected. Her argument is that Liz Truss uh, was driving the car off the road, if you like. You're now driving it into the central reservation, overcorrecting. And there was another way, which was a middle pass. She said the autumn statement was an overcorrection to that mini budget, going from one extreme to the other is hardly reassuring for people. A middle ground was needed. What's your response to that, to, to colleagues and the public that think you've gone too far? Well, um, my response, first of all, Esther is a brilliant colleague. I think the world of her. Um, I have great admiration for her, and uh, I think she's a fantastic campaigner. Um, but uh, the charge of overcorrection is not borne out by what the independent OBR says. They, says that the measure, they say that the measures that I announced uh, actually make the recession shallower, that the fall in GDP, which could damage people's living standards, threaten jobs, is 1% less as a result of the decisions that I announced on Thursday, even the Labour Party say they accept the OBR's figures. So they accept that what I announced is actually making uh, the recession shallower for families up and down the country. And so we were very, very careful to make sure that we got that balance right. But what people wouldn't have wanted is me not to take the decisions that bring down inflation. Because the biggest worry for families up and down the country is seeing the cost of that weekly shop go up. Yeah. And that's what Can I wanted to make sure that uh, we did something about. The average household is going to be £1,400 worse off. You know that there's a lost decade where living standards fall back to levels uh, not seen since 2013. The sharpest fall uh, in household disposable incomes in over six decades. You can see why Jacob Rees-Mogg described your autumn statement as a decision to lose you the next election. Is that fair? Well, I think what people want from a Conservative government is, uh, is a team of people who will take the difficult decisions irrespective of whether it's good for their political fortunes because it's right for the country. And the plan that I announced uh, brings down inflation, which is the biggest worry for families up and down the country. It gets the economy growing healthily and it helps people with their energy bills with, with one-off payments in this year and the next year. Uh, particularly focusing on the most vulnerable people. You accept it's bad for your political fortunes and this autumn statement? No, because I actually think in the end that's why people vote Conservative, because they trust us on the economy to take difficult decisions 
and that's what we've done. And what tax cuts in 2024 if you can? Well, I would like to bring down taxes as soon as it's responsible, but as a Conservative faced with a choice between sound money and low taxes, mm. sound money has to come first because inflation eats away at your savings, it eats away at your salary far more insidiously even than taxes. Chance, a final question because how can I not ask when we are sitting on the site where HS2 will be built, talking about sound money, and I don't want to turn this into the Esther McVeigh interview, um, but Esther McVeigh's also spoken about HS2, arguing that it's too expensive. Many of your colleagues you know have made that argument as well. You, you, you no doubt will tell me it's necessary for boosting productivity and levelling up. How much is it going to cost? Well, Beth, let me say this. Um, I, as a Conservative, am committed to spreading wealth and opportunity throughout our whole country. And we have a very unbalanced economy with much higher concentrations of wealth and better paid jobs in London and the South East than in the rest of the country. The way you solve that is by improving the connections between London and the rest of the country so that we can spread that wealth, spread that opportunity. I've just been out uh, meeting one of the apprentices, one of the 1,000 apprentices working on the HS2 programme. It's an incredible programme. Uh, what we're seeing from it is already investment is happening in Birmingham and in the West Midlands as companies anticipate the, the uplift that's going to be created by HS2. So my message from last Thursday was, yes, this is tough, but we aren't going to compromise on the really big projects that make a difference to our economy, and HS2 is one of those. OK, Chancellor, thank you so much. Thank you. Jeremy Hunt there in Coles Hill near Birmingham. And if you scan this QR code on screen right now, you can watch all of our interviews online and all of the previous episodes of the show. And you can also listen to the Beth Rigby Interviews podcast by scanning that QR code on your screen now. A new episode's available each week as I take a look at the highlights of the interviews and there's some extra bits and pieces in there too as we talk through politics more generally. That's on the Sky News app or wherever you get your podcast. Give it a try. Well, that's all for today's show. Thanks so much for watching and thank you to Jeremy Hunt for giving us some of his time. Next week, we're going to be back on Tuesday at nine o'clock for a one-off special show that you won't want to miss. So I hope to see you then.